Afternoon campers, welcome back to the channel. Something a little bit different today. I've been asked a lot of questions about this thing, specifically, where do I keep it? How do I keep it? How long does it take to get ready to fly? And uh, how does it differ from the PB? So in this video, I'm gonna answer all of those questions. So my aircraft is hangered here at Micro Maintenance at Darlingmore Airfield, and it's kept in the hangar in the state that you see me behind. So it's semi-rigged or semi-de-rigged. Basically, the wing is on top of the trike, but it's all folded back. The advantage of this is it doesn't take up a lot of room. It's cheaper to hanger it because it's de-rigged. So it's very manoeuvrable, as I've already showed you. And very often, if I've not been flying for a while, I'll come back to Darlingmore and I'll find that my aircraft is buried at the back of the hangar, about seven aircraft deep. But the advantage of it is because it's so small and manoeuvrable, you can thread it in between other aircraft. You can you can slide it under the wings of things like a C42 and stuff like that. It fits underneath those, so you can thread it through without having to do a lot of manoeuvring. So that's a big advantage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see how long it takes me to de-rig it. And with the head cam, I'm gonna walk you through the process and show you what's involved. So the first thing you need to do is take off the wing cover. This is basically here just to keep the wind protected from uh, bird crap and other such stuff. I think what I'll probably do is put up a timer as well just to see how long this takes me. Uh, when you buy a wing, an Aeros wing, it comes with loads and loads and loads of these blue bags. Um, there's lots of them. Some of them aren't even on here at the moment, some of them are still in the hangar. Uh, and initially it can be quite daunting, quite daunting remembering where they all go. Uh, and I must admit I still struggle where some of them go. If you do buy a wing though, a uh, Flylight, uh, an Aeros wing I should say, from Flylight or from one of the dealers, don't worry though, they will spend an entire day showing you where all of these bags go. Um, and they'll take you through the rigging and de-rigging process. And the more you do it, it becomes uh, second nature anyway. There's Mr. Fowler. <laughs> so as I say, there's lots of these uh, protective bags, which just basically keep the wing protected. Uh, when you're moving it about so that the wings, part, parts of the wing, for example, these bits here, which can be quite sharp, if that was to rub against the sail, over time it could cause some damage. So these pads are just there to protect that uh, and sharp things like that from causing any sort of damage. Okay, so this is the front of the aircraft. These are the battens. They're kept in a bag which are stored on the top of the wing just down there when uh, the wing's not in use. Put those to one side for a moment. Make sure you don't stand on these because that'd be bad. And then, basically, the wing just folds out. Let's just make sure I've got all of that on this camera. move you back here a little bit there we go okay so the first thing you need to do is take your battens again in a nice blue storage bag and you feed these in so these are handed there's a green side and there's a red side the way I remember it is red is never right ie it's left um, I'm not sure where the uh, red and green thing came from if you know why we have a red side and a green side and why the red's on the left and the green's on the right, you let me know. There goes Mr. F. Noisy bugger. <laughs> right, these are all numbered as well. So uh, as they go from the inboard to the outboard edge of the wing, the wing gets narrower. So consequently, these ribs, or these battens I should say, get shorter. So they're all numbered. Number one is already in there. Number ones always stay in place. And then you've got two, three, four, five, and six. 
Um, and then these just go in the batten pockets in order. I don't put them all the way in for now. I'll show you in a minute how they all clip in. Uh, it's dead simple. This wing really is very, very simple to put together. Three. two more buttons there is a transverse button which goes across ways hence the name in there I'll show you what that's for in a minute and then there's this out outer edge uh, over center catch so basically you fold it in the middle and uh, I'm not gonna be able to show you this I don't think I'll be able to show you this with the camera reach in there just just down there there's a little tang which the end of that goes into and then the other end goes into this little webbing strap here. And then once you've got both ends in place, you push it in the middle and it locks like that. And an outer, uh, I think these are called sprogs. I'm sure somebody will correct me if I've got it wrong. That just uh, wash out uh, rod. It just keeps the uh, leading edge up. And then an inner sprog, which rests on the underside of this transverse button. And that's what gives you your reflex, which I'll tell you all about in a minute. And then the way that these, uh, some wings, they have like bungees, um, which hold the end of the batten in place. These are even simpler than that. These are genius ideas. So basically you just click, click it open like that. And then this end here feeds into a little gap in the trailing edge of the wing like that. And then snap it shut. And that keeps it nice and taut. You can adjust the tension by unscrewing and screwing these uh, these plastic ends in. So again, like that, dead simple. And sometimes it is useful being six foot two. I don't know how Giles manages. I'm going to leave the outer ones for now. Once the wing's tensioned, I'll show you that in a minute. Then uh, then I'll tension the outer ones. Uh, because it's just a bit easier once the wing's tensioned up. So then again, you just repeat the process for the other side. So this is the green side, starting with number one's already in there. So starting with number two. It's important that you feed these in nice and gently. And if you get any resistance, don't try and force it in because you can damage the batten pocket. And it's also a good idea every now and again, just to spray these buttons with a little bit of silicon spray just to, uh, just to help them in. One, two. Three. One of the things you need to make sure with these um, these battens, and I think it's part of the service schedule, is they need to be symmetrical. So, i.e. Say for example, the one that I'm putting in now, number five, the number five button needs to be exactly the same shape as the number five button over the other side. So a periodic check, uh, which I do uh, over the winter, is take all the battens out, make sure that they're all symmetrical. And then when you buy the wing, it comes with a batten profile, which shows you what shape they should all be. So you need to check it against that as well. Uh, uh, do the inner sprog. And then again on this side you've got the uh, transverse batten which I should really have put in first. There we go. Should just say at this point, I'm just putting the wing together. I'm not doing any um, pre-flight inspection. That is a separate process that you should do once you've assembled the wing. Although when you put the wing together, it is a good opportunity just to make sure that everything is uh, as it should be. I also, before I send, before I tension the wing, this is something I very often forget to do. There is a batten here at the nose as well. The nose batten, very imaginative title. 
um, and this needs to go in place like that and then that goes there oh, the wind's picking up um, okay so that's in place it's a lot easier to put that in place before you tension the wing uh, which is what I'm going to do next so having put all the buttons in place the next thing to do is to tension the wing and the way that uh, what I mean by tension the wing is uh, you have to this cross member here which is jointed in the middle which runs all the way along the link along the wing that gets pulled back which forces it to straighten out and that straightens the wing out and tensions it and the way that you do that is there is a little handle I don't know if you can see this I hope so somewhere where is it down here there is a little handle and as you can see when you pull on that handle it pulls this cross member back so the easiest way to do this I find is to put your leg behind this uh, undercarriage leg here that stops it from rolling backwards with your left hand pull on this bar and at the same time pull on the handle and that lets you put the wing back shut up Siri and that just clips in there okay so that uh, there clips in there and that keeps the tension on the wing now the other thing you need to do is just to make sure that those make sure that these wires here aren't twisted in this sleeve so another check to do is just to come down to the end have a look and make sure that those wires aren't twisted which they aren't so that is the wing tensioned the last thing to do well, actually, no, the next thing to do, I find, whilst you can still reach it, is to put the nose cone on. Do not be tempted to try and fly without this because it will handle, it will affect the handling. So there's Velcro, Velcro there and there, and on the other side there's Velcro there and there, and that matches up with the four Velcro spots on the nose cone. Um, put it on the right way around, that'd help. That quite simply just attaches on there. That goes in there like that. Okay, so that's the wing built. The next thing to do is you have to lift the wing into place. Um, so, lift it on the control bar, lift the wing up, and you hear that click? That click was uh, this uh, silver, um, it's like a spring loaded uh, little tab. Um, the front strut there's a tube inside a tube and that's what lets it slide up and down um, and this strut here when it gets into the right place these fire out and lock it into place but then as a safety measure there is also an extra um, not sure what this is called I don't know what it's called and basically you feed this through um, these are uh, locking rings, these are all over the aircraft. So I should say really it's not a good idea to put your aircraft together in long grass like I'm doing because if you drop these in the grass they'll never be seen again. But they're not expensive. Okay, the last thing to do, now that the wing is lifted, this tube here, when the wing is down it's at more of an angle um, and there are two bolts that go through here which hold this tube in position. So once the wing is lifted into position should have got this ready beforehand there's an extra bolt which lives in that bag all the time and that just goes through there Don't need to do it up dead tight. That goes on there. And that is the aircraft built and ready to fly. So that probably took a bit longer than it would normally do because I was stopping and waving at Giles and trying to show you some stuff. Um, but it doesn't take very long at all.
So now I've shown you how to put this thing together, I realise I've done loads and loads of videos where I've been flying it, but I've never actually shown you around it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you around it, and I'm going to point out some of the key differences between this, the Bivy B, and the more popular PB and the Adam. Um, because there's lots of videos about PBs and Adams on YouTube, um, not so many about this thing. So I'm going to show you some of the differences. Okay, so the main difference between this and a PB is that this aircraft is designed from the outset as an SSDR aircraft. So it, uh, it's not designed to meet the 70 kilogram weight limit. Uh, that is why you will notice that I've got a G reg, because um, you have to register it with the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, and I have to have a license to fly it. The reason for that is because all in, um, this weighs I think 78 kilograms all told. Um, so obviously, not being sub 70, I need a license to fly it uh, and it needs to be registered. So one of the differences you'll notice between this trike and the PB trike is this, uh, the, the trike itself is, is slightly heavier. Um, it's got, it, uh, it hasn't got any, any lightning uh, added to it, it hasn't got any holes. Um, this trike is actually cheaper than an Adam trike or a PB trike. The reason being that the Adam and the PB trike starts out the same as this, but then fly like have to drill loads of holes into it to make it lighter. Um, consequently, it's more expensive because there's more manufacturing that goes into it. But this uh, is a solid tube here, so no holes in it. Uh, that does have a bit of a disadvantage in that if you need to fire to feed a wire from the front end down to the back end in the Adam in the PB there's loads of wires that run down the uh, this middle bit you can't do that on this um, so you have to get some clips and you know velcro and all that sort of stuff but that's one difference anyway uh, the tubes are all solid with no holes in them uh, the next difference between this and the PB is the engine this has got a Corsair black ball uh, engine on it so it's 235 cc and it puts out 33 brake horsepower. It is noticeably bigger. If you stand uh, this next to uh, a PB, this engine is noticeably bigger. Uh, and also the prop's longer. This is a 1.4 meter prop, whereas the, uh, the most of 185 engines are normally turning a 1.3 meter prop. So this puts out, as I say, quite a bit more power. Uh, it's also heavier, which is another reason why this aircraft would never make uh, sub 70 kilograms. Okay, so by far the biggest difference between the Bivy B aircraft and the PB and the Adam is the wing. Um, the wing on this is an Aeros Fox 13 TL wing, and it differs quite significantly from the Adam and the PB wing. Um, the main difference being that uh, you'll notice that this aircraft has solid struts. Um, these struts support the weight of the wing, both when it's on the ground, when the wing's pressing down, but also when it's flying as well, when the wings want to try and lift up. So these are uh, carrying both compression and tension. On the PB uh, and the Adam, the, uh, the, these aren't solid struts, these are just flying wires and they support the weight of the wing in the air when the wing's lifting up. When the PB and the Adam wing is on the ground, the weight of the wing is supported by uh, a king post which pokes out the top of the wing and a series of luff lines. Um, whereas you'll see on this wing, uh, there are, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a topless wing, there's no king post poking out the top. Um, one of the advantages of that is that uh, if you are leaving the aircraft rigged, you don't need as much headroom. Um, also, if you fly in limbo competitions, then uh, every little bit helps. Right, so sitting in the aircraft, let me just take that off. One of the beauties of this type of flying is it's very, very minimalistic. Um, you will see there is not a lot to look at. There's not a lot of uh, knobs and dials and instruments and stuff like that. And you don't want that. The best view is out that way, not down here. Um, but I'll show you what little bits I have got. Uh, firstly, down here, I've got something called a Moto Monitor. Um, and that connects to a transmitter. Sorry for the sunlight which is just up there. I'll show you a better picture of that in a moment. Um, and obviously the engine's not running at the moment, but the motor monitor um, detects or picks up cylinder head temperature, 22 degrees there. And there's also a graphical representation of the cylinder head temperature there. There's an alarm built in, so if the cylinder head temperature gets too hot, then this thing will start beeping and start flashing and tell me. Uh, the center dial there is engine RPM at the moment, is zero because the engine's off. Um, and this seems to be fairly accurate. 
Um, from this you can work out uh, you know, what sort of engine RPM you need in the glide and the climb and all the rest of it. You can also use this to make sure that you are getting full power. At full power my engine tops out at 8000 RPM. Um, it also gives me a rate of climb which is on this dial here at the moment. I'm not climbing because I'm not moving. Um, but it gives me the rate of climb in meters per second. I wish it gave rate of climb in feet per minute because that's what I'm more used to. I don't think you can change it. Anybody that does know if you can change it, please leave me a comment below and let me know. Um, you can also fit an exhaust gas temperature to this motor monitor. My aircraft hasn't got that because there isn't anywhere in the exhaust to fit the probe. Um, but that's what this dial over here is. That's why it says, Ugh. that stands for error. Um, it's just saying that that, sen that sensor is not uh, connected. Um, This unit also does have an inbuilt GPS, so from that it can work out your ground speed and also your altitude. Uh, and it also gives you the time as well. So that's my motor monitor. Uh, moving up, I've got a straightforward compass for if you're doing any navigation the old fashioned way. Uh, you need to, be able, be, need to be able to know which way you're pointing. So that pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, this thing, now then, this is called a quad lock. I get asked a lot of questions about this. A lot of people saying, how do you fit your mobile phone to your aircraft and I do it using a quad lock. These are brilliant, I've had these for years, I've used these for cycling, I've used them on my motorbike um, and they are becoming increasingly popular for these sorts of things. So basically this quad lock mount, it fits to the front straw as you can see uh, and then my phone has a special case, a quad lock case uh, and basically that hole there fits that nicely and the way that you attach it, you can do it one handed, uh, you just uh, line it up, twist it, it clicks in place and that is there now, that is not moving anywhere. And to release it, you just press that little blue tab there, give it a twist and off it comes. So it is that simple. Um, so if you are wondering how to connect a phone or hold onto a phone, uh, then look at the Quadlock website. Uh, they've got cases for all different types of phones. And if your particular type of phone isn't listed, they do a universal mount, which is basically this bit here that you can stick onto the back of any flat case. So moving on up, we come to this box here, which uh, is called a Sky Echo. And this is an EC device or an electronic conspicuity device. There we go, I managed to get that out first time. Oh, I hate that word, conspicuity. Um, so what this does uh, in simple terms is it sends out a signal. I think it's called an ADSB signal. I can't remember what that stands for. I'll put that on the screen. Um, but it puts out a signal which transmits my um, height or altitude. Uh, and also my position uh, and it detects that because there's an inbuilt GPS in this thing which I think is more accurate than on my phone so um, this is what I use for GPS positioning as well so it sends out that signal uh, and it also picks up uh, the same signal from other aircraft that are fitted with these types of devices so that I can see where other aircraft are and they can see me and that's the whole idea behind it it's a safety thing it's a case of uh, it improves situational awareness, especially if you're in a busy bit of airspace where there's lots of aircraft, you can see where a lot of them are. You have to bear in mind that not everybody is running electronic conspicuity, so you still need to rely on Mark 1 eyeball, which is the number one means of uh, finding out uh, if you are going to come into conflict with anything else. So um, the way this works then is my iPhone, uh, this thing puts out a Wi-Fi signal, so PB Sky Echo. So you connect to the Wi-Fi, and then I run an app on my phone called Sky Demon, which is here. Uh, so if I type fly, uh, I want to fly using my Sky Echo. There you go. And it's now picked up my position, and it's showing me on Darlingmore Airfield, which is good, because that's where I am. Um, I don't know if there are any other aircraft about at the moment. There we go. So, <laughs> there's Mr. Fowler. Golf, Foxtrot, Whiskey at Lima Romeo. So he's got one of these as well. So I can see that Giles is um, a thousand feet in the air. That's what the plus one means. And he is just to the west of Ashbourne. And similarly, he'll be able to see that I'm here. Although having said that, I think when you're not, when you're not actually moving or flying, it doesn't put out a signal. Um, but essentially that's how it works anyway. So that talks to that. Uh, and in terms of instrumentation, that is it. It's about as basic as you can get. 
Um, in terms of controls, then I'm not going to go into how a flex wing flies because that's not my job. I'm not an instructor. But in terms of what this aircraft has got, um, it is fitted with a foot throttle only, which is on the right hand side there. There is a foot throttle. And on the left hand side, this aircraft is fitted with a single disc brake, which I'll show you in just a moment. This brake is surprisingly effective. It is more than capable of locking up the front wheel, particularly if you're on, uh, on wet grass. So there are your foot controls. There is no hand throttle on this, not yet. That could be coming. And that essentially is a walk around the Bivy Bee. If there's anything I've missed or you've got any questions, then uh, just stick a comment down below. I do read all of the comments and I respond to all of the comments as well. So if there's anything else that I've missed that you want to know, ask me the question and I'll do my best.